Awesome. Welcome everyone to uh, this edition of um, Growing Up in Science, uh, the, the global series. So uh, who is, is, is here at the Growing Up in Science for the first time? Maybe raise your hand. Okay, I, I see at least several hands. So maybe quickly what this is about. So uh, we started in 2014 at NYU as a series to highlight the human stories of scientists because we, we hear a lot of polished talks about research, but we rarely hear what's going on behind the scenes, what kind of struggles and failures a scientist has um, experienced in their career, what kind of doubts they had as a graduate students, what uh, other careers they considered, uh, what they are still struggling with now. Uh, so this was an opportunity to bridge the gap between uh, trainees and faculty. And it's also a, a way to start talking in the community about uh, human themes, themes that have to do with the experience of doing science, like uh, uh, lack of motivation or uh, balance between work and life, etc. Uh, so since then, it has been spread. This growing up in science model has been um, replicated in other places, and we also, since the start of the pandemic, have an have an online series. Uh, we're thrilled to have uh, Nancy Kamish here as our guest in the online series uh, today. Uh, and um, uh, Nancy is a, a professor at, uh, in neuroscience at MIT. And uh, I met Nancy for the first time uh, almost exactly uh, 20 years ago when uh, I was uh, just fresh out of a PhD in physics and I was thinking of uh, switching to neuroscience. So I was touring a couple of labs in the US. And even though I had absolutely nothing to offer to Nancy's lab, which was relatively new at the time. She was incredibly warm and welcoming and, and she hosted me and uh, she, she, she took my interest seriously and, and that uh, is still a very warm memory. So Nancy is a wonderful person. We've um, over the years stayed in touch to some extent and um, uh, all of you probably know um, her science, but today it's going to be about Nancy's personal story. So, before we get started, just a couple of logistical things. Uh, it would be lovely if you if you feel, would feel comfortable enough to turn on your video so that we can sort of see each other and have have a sense to be of being in the same room. But of course, no 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 obligation. Uh, thank you. Uh, uh, questions uh, can come during the talk. Okay, so don't wait until the end. Just type them in the chat, uh, and I will I will read them. And I might even ask you to uh, unmute yourself if you're if you, if you would like to speak. Um, and um, I think I think that's 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 really it. Um, so uh, Nancy, without further ado, uh, the floor is yours. Thanks, Weiji. Well, I have to start by um, um, contradicting Weiji. Uh, when he visited my lab way back, he had lots to offer. He gave us the most fabulous talk on string theory. And everybody in my lab was so psyched to learn about string theory. And he covered our whole, like one wall of whiteboard with fancy string theory stuff. And we thought it was so cool and so fancy. We left it up for like six months. Nobody would cover the string theory because it was like so cool. <laughs> so that was super fun. Uh, anyway, thanks for inviting me to talk here. Um, I've um, shared with Weiji some anxieties that it feels kind of narcissistic to carry on about myself. Um, I don't think of myself as special, just lucky as hell, uh, but I gather that's useful too. So I'm stifling the uh, feeling that it's kind of somehow inappropriate to do a monologue about myself. It will help if you guys ask questions, just interrupt, um, but I will give it a shot. Um, so let's see, I grew up in Woods Hole, Massachusetts, which is a magical place. Some of you may know it. If not, consider taking a summer course there just for the chance to hang out in Woods Hole, if nothing else, it's fabulous. And Woods Hole is a very special place in many ways. Um, for me as a kid, science was just handed to me on a platter. Um, nearly everybody was a scientist, uh, it seemed. And we had the best biology library in the world. Back then, anybody could walk in. I remember going there late at night in the middle of the winter with no one else in the library but me. It was like a very special place and a kind of revered um, opportunity. And uh, there were so many scientists in town that one summer in our little town of a few thousand people, 
somebody counted 13 Nobel Prize winners. <laughs> and uh, uh, I, I remember like sneaking into the neural systems and behavior class. Like, I don't know if that was like late college or early grad school, but in any case, way before I was <clears throat> in a position to be admitted to the class, I would just sneak in and go. Uh, they had all the uh, lectures listed, I think they still do. And so there was just all manner of opportunity. And in, in Woods Hole, um, the cool place to be on a Friday evening was of course the Friday evening lecture. So even when we were you know, pretty little kids, we would go to the Friday evening lecture. It was just the happening thing in town. And uh, I remember vividly when my dad, who was a scientist, gave a Friday evening lecture. It was a big deal. There were hundreds of people there. I was very proud of my dad and he was very you know, kind of irreverent to the point of borderline um, inappropriate. That's my dad, that's what he was like. Uh, but we, I was very proud and it was, I think he started his lecture, it was the first one of the summer. I think he started off by saying, it's so great to have all you summer people back here because now we get our garbage collected twice a week. I think that was the beginning, that was my dad. He was a nut, but anyway. <laughs> um, anyway, um, uh, maybe 20 years after that, I gave my first, Friday, my only Friday evening lecture in Woods Hole and it was probably the biggest deal talk of my life to me because my parents were there, my friends were there, my friends' parents, my parents' friends, like it was like, it was like a wedding or something. It was, uh, it was awesome. Um, anyway, that's Woods Hole. Um, and as I mentioned, my dad was a scientist. So I had a real front row seat. He was a field biologist and his niche, his training was in physics. So his niche was to make electronic devices that you could attach to free ranging animals that would send back information about heart rate and temperature and all kinds of physiological variables like that, which are, you know, you can buy these things for 10 bucks now from Edmund Scientific. But at the time, my dad was like the only one who could make these things. So that was his ticket. And oh my God, did he have a blast. He went to the Arctic and up the Amazon and all over Africa. And he worked on porpoises and Arctic fishes and salt grasses and ostriches and he got the first part read of a whale and so forth. I mean, he had a hell of a good time. I still remember as a kid um, driving around Woods Hole with him chasing after a seagull that he had spray painted day glow orange. Why? Because he had attached a transmitter to it. It was sending back heart rate information and I was holding his antenna out the car window and he's driving around, dad, I think it's over there. Woo, we were just, like, driving all over Woods Hole trying to follow this seagull to see, to, you know, while listening to its heartbeat. And actually I remember at one point um, there was this mystery because the seagull um, had this very regular schedule. It would go over to Martha's Vineyard and then back to Woods Hole at the same time every morning. And we're like, what the hell is that? Until somebody thought to look up the ferry schedule and the seagull was following the scary, the ferry and so somebody called the uh, steamship authority and they said, yeah, the tourists have been asking what that orange seagull is doing following the, following the ferry. Anyway, that was, uh, that was uh, some of the early involvement with science. Um, not everything was, I mean, I had a pretty damn lucky childhood. Uh, not everything was perfect. I um, was horsing around at Stony Beach. If you've been to Woods Hole, you've probably been to Stony Beach. Um, with some friends when I was 15, I jumped off a friend's shoulders and shattered three vertebrae in my neck and was quadriplegic underwater. Um, and uh, as you can see, I'm fine now, but it was quite a journey. I was in traction for a long time. Uh, my very smart mom had heard about something called a halo where you could basically have bolts screwed into your skull and big steel posts and you could have your summer back walking around in this really disgusting contraption. And so pretty soon I was back uh, running around, dancing, sailing, all of that with my halo on. Uh, so, um, so it wasn't too bad. Uh, I went to um, Falmouth High School, which uh, I gather is a lot better now. It was not so awesome back then. There was a very strong anti-intellectual vibe. If you were smart, you moved to hide it. Um, Thank God for an amazing math teacher named Andy Vince, who had this after school thing where he would run this math seminar and he would give a, like five or six of us these really 
hard math problems and we would be so excited about it and we would stay up late working together trying to solve these problems and usually we couldn't solve them but it was so much fun um so let's see around my third year in high school i beginning of my third year i started to realize i'm just not learning anything here it's a total waste of time so I thought, well, what the hell, I'll just go to, I'll skip the senior year and just go to college. So I abruptly applied to a bunch of colleges, um, including MIT, where I did not get in. Uh, the one place I got in was Wellesley. So I went to Wellesley. Um, and boy, I really did not fit in at Wellesley. Oh my God, I did not fit in. I mean, just from day one, I arrived um, and my roommate was not there, but you can see she had taken this very large closet and the whole thing was full of fancy clothes. In contrast, I arrived with, you know, a few clothes like tied up in a sheet and my windsurfer and my pot plant. And so uh, we did not mesh <laughs> and I just did not mesh with Wellesley. So I transferred to MIT a year later and uh, I, are there questions coming in? Just butt in if I'm, going on. And right now, uh, people are just introducing themselves. I okay. asked. Okay, I see uh, people popping up. Okay, good. Um, so uh, I fit in much better at MIT. It was more of my kind of place. Nobody cared what you look like or how you dressed. Um, there was really no interest in that kind of thing. Um, it was about 10% women at the time. So that was pretty wild. Um, but it didn't bother me. My strategy was just be one of the boys. And hope nobody notices. And basically, I think most people didn't notice. <laughs> um, and so that worked out for me. Um, it was pretty hard. I mean, it was very hard. I was completely not prepared. Um, and I worked really hard and I got a bunch of C's. I remember getting a C in second semester organic chemistry that I worked hard on. And I just felt like a total failure. Um, I spent a lot of time crying in my room, feeling like I didn't belong there and like I didn't have it. And it was rough. I mean, I, I loved the intellectual intensity. I loved a lot of the stuff I was doing, but it was hard. Um, somewhere in there, I think just after my freshman year, so, my so dad- you, Like who, who were you able to uh, share those feelings with? Who did you talk to? No one. No one, okay. No one. But even your parents. I just cried in my room. Okay. Yeah. I mean, I might have, I might have talked to my parents about it. I can't actually remember. Yeah. I think I felt like this was my problem alone. You know, it's just so crazy. Like, what? Yeah. It's stupid actually to feel like it's your problem alone. But I think that's really common. Um, you know, when I meet with my undergrad advisees now, I don't even like look at the courses they've registered for until we spend a bunch of time on. Who are their friends? Who are they talking to? What yeah. else are they doing? Because you can't do anything else until you get the, right. you know, basic basics in place. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so um, I mean, it was awesome. I loved MIT, but it, it was rough. Um, so let's see. Uh, I majored in biology, and that was okay. Um, but I, but when I worked in labs, like the first thing you had to do was kill a mouse. And I didn't have a thought out ethical objection, but it just wasn't fun. You know, I just didn't look forward to it, like starting by sticking the pencil behind his neck and pulling up its tail. It's like, Bleh. and so then I thought, well, what department could I work in where they don't kill their subjects first? Oh, <laughs> that would be the psychology department. <laughs> um, so I started looking at listings for undergrad research in the psychology department. And I found this one that's sounded pretty cool, like understanding words and pictures, like really? Like you can study that, what? Um, but I was very nervous, very, very nervous. So I remember making a phone call from a pay phone in Harvard Square about this listing for a research position. And this lovely lady answers and she's really nice. And we talked for a while. And after about a half an hour, she says, well, you sound like a reasonable person. How about you come in and let's meet? And, and what did you say your name was? And I tell her my name and there's a pause. And she says, are you from what's hold? <laughs> yes. And she says, my brother-in-law just bought your old house on Buzzard Bay Avenue. <laughs> Crazy. <laughs> anyway, 
that was Molly Potter, the amazing and magnificent Molly Potter, who was just an absolutely brilliant scientist and endlessly patient um, and caring advisor. And I worked in her lab and had a blast. And uh, I remember like, you know, six or I forget exactly how much later at some point she says, well, you know, you should apply to grad school. I'm like, really? I still felt like, you know, a loser. I had C's on my transcript. Like I think more than one. I was like, really? And she's like, well, you know, give it a shot. Um, and so I applied to MIT and I was admitted on April 14th. And you know what that means? That means I got in off the very bottom of the waiting list. <laughs> Ma Molly later told me the faculty members who had objections and frankly, I, you know, I don't blame them. I had to pretty, you know, I didn't have that much going for me. God knows why she pushed for me to get in. Anyway, thank you, Molly. I get into grad school and uh, that was, um, it was a fun time. It was a really fun time. Um, we oh, barely, uh, yeah. Just to ask you a friend question. So knowing that you were on the wait list going in, did that give you sort of uh, imposter feelings to start with already or? No, oh, yeah. yeah. Yeah, I mean, I was like, I was extremely unconfident. Yeah. You know, I mean, on the one hand, I grew up with all this privilege around all these scientists. You'd think I'd be like marching in with no problem, but um, for whatever reason, probably because I'd found undergrad experience at MIT pretty, pretty challenging and pretty kind of bruising inspiring and bruising at the same time I didn't I just felt like that it was a miracle that I was there and um you know and I didn't know if I was going to be able to do it I remember this strong sense of you know I almost thought of myself as guilty until proven innocent it was like are you ever going to be able to do anything useful and I was like judging myself right yeah. um but I had lots of ideas for experiments I was studying things like online sentence processing and understanding scenes and uh, doing a lot of experiments on semantic priming. And I was pretty resilient for a while because oh, there were all these cool things to do and I kept try trying them, but actually all of my experiments bombed. And after a few years, I mean, it must've been eight or 10 different things where I'd say, okay, let's ask this question. And I'd put together an experiment and it would just bomb, like just get garbage for data. And I started to feel pretty bad and um, I, you know, I tried to drop out of grad school multiple times and Molly would sit with me and say, okay, let's look at what you've done. Like, instead of just saying, you know, like I would have been totally understandable if she'd said, yeah, like, you know, you've been here for a while. It's not happening <laughs> enough already. Uh, but instead she would like patiently, you know, tell me why actually those experiments were really okay. And I was unlucky and so forth, you know, and in hindsight, I think, you know, part of it is that especially the kind of behavioral experiments I was trying to do then, there are all these little teeny effects, like semantic priming. You know, you know, you, you do, you have to just, the word, you know, nurse comes up and you're supposed to say it's a word, not a non-word. And if it follows doctor, you're a little bit faster than if it follows table. Okay, that's semantic priming. And in the literature, that was a 60 millisecond effect. So we're doing all this, by the way, with a tachiscoscope. Like I'm making each stimulus by hand on a card and putting it <laughs> in this thing, right? So they're kind of labor intensive to run. And, um, you know, I was not getting semantic priming effects like those in the literature. And I'd sit with Molly and be, yeah, sure, there'd be like a, you know, 12 to 18 millisecond effect. But that felt like not replicating the literature. And eventually we realized that, you know, that's how big semantic priming is if you don't cheat. You know, if you actually balance everything else, that's how big the effect is. But it took a very long time to realize that that's why those experiments weren't working. And that was rough. Um, so anyway, um, uh, I, you know, I never would have stayed in without Molly encouraging me and encouraging me. And, you know, especially after I went off and did all these other things, trying to be a journalist, I just decided, okay, science isn't happening. I'm going to go do something important, I'm going to be a journalist, and then I would just try crazy things and be gone for a few months, and instead of kicking me out, she would take me back. Um, yeah, could you could you tell, tell us a bit more about where that interest came from? Uh, did that gradually develop? Yeah, well, I, yeah, okay, I think it came from two main things. One, uh, I always used to think of politics as kind of an ugly, messy business that I didn't want any part of, 
um, until one day I was walking across the MIT campus and Noam Chomsky was speaking in front of the student center and I was just walking by and he made an extremely obvious point that had never occurred to me before. And that was, you think you don't need to worry about this. This is not your business, these you know, wars that we were running all over Central America at the time, um, build up of nuclear weapons, all this stuff. You, you, know, you may think this is not your problem, but it is your problem. You guys are taxpayers, you pay for this. You are directly morally responsible. And on the one hand, like why the hell had that not occurred to me before, but it hadn't. And so that was very influential. That just one little thing I heard as I walked by. But the other reason was my experiments weren't working. So I started spending more and more time reading the newspaper. You know, it's like, the data are a mess. I'm gonna read the paper, just in frustration. And the more I read the New York Times, the more enraged I got. You know, this is the height of, you know, the Contra Wars that we were running out of Central America and just, you know, like brutal killing of nuns and just like, like really horrible stuff that the US military was directly supporting. Um, and so um, eventually, so I kept thinking, well, this is, there was a particularly, there was a woman who was a journalist at the Boston Globe named Pamela Constable, I think that was her name. And I, she was incredible. I would like read her stories and she was like traveling with the Salvadoran guerrillas and you know, in this obviously dangerous situation, getting these really important stories out, she was my hero. And so I kept thinking about how am I gonna to get to do that? And then one day I just thought, oh, what the hell? And I called the Boston Globe and asked for Pamela Constable and amazingly she picked up the phone. And I said, so how did you get to do that? And she said, I wrote about fires for seven years before I got to do anything interesting. And I thought, oh my God. <laughs> And at that point, I thought, okay, I'm not, that's too, that's too long a period. It's too big an investment for something that I don't know how it's gonna be. Oh, and around the same time, my then partner had dumped me for a person I shared an office with that was about six by eight feet. I mean, I don't know, okay, maybe eight by 10 feet. Tiny office, I share this office with her. I mean, my just, everything was a mess. My experiments weren't working. My love life was a mess. I just thought, you know, why don't I just try it? So I flew to Managua at the peak of the Contra War. I had no idea what I was doing. My Spanish sucked. I just, you know, anyway, but I just thought, what the hell? I'm just going to try this. So I fly to Managua and I started, um, you know, just trying to be a journalist. And so I would just call people up in my broken Spanish and schedule interviews. And I hitchhiked all over uh, northern Nicaragua in army jeeps. And it was like, it sounds kind of crass to say it, but it was a blast. I mean, it was exciting. It was interesting. I would like, you know, put on a bikini and hang out at the Hotel Intercontinental Pool where all of these, um, you know, the, basically the Contra War that was being run out of Honduras, the guys, the, the US, you know, CIA guys who were running the thing would come to Managua and hang out at the Intercontinental Pool. And so you just hang out there in your bikini and you chat with them. And it was amazing the stuff you could learn. <laughs> anyway, it was, it was fun and fascinating. Did you, um, did you have a bigger plan to you when you're preparing to write a, write a piece? Or? I tried. I wrote some stuff. It sucked. <laughs> um, nobody would publish it, and I don't blame them. Anyway, so that was just <laughs> one of several kind of little forays where um, you didn't have any any training, right? You didn't. No. Course, you no. Didn't, uh, I didn't even know a journalist other than my one brief phone call with Pamela Constable. I just, I mean, although. Monago was full of lefty journalists. And so actually it was, <laughs> we all hung out together and compared notes. And, um, and that, was, that was actually the only other journalist I talked to was all these other kind of radicals who were <laughs> living in Monago at the time. It was pretty, anyway, it was, it was wild and fun. <laughs> um, anyway, the other, the other thing that happened in grad school was um, I think my first year in grad school, the first, um, brain imaging study uh, in humans, in human visual cortex was published on the cover of Science. I think it was 1981. It was Phelps and Maziota at UCLA. And they uh, did a pet study of people looking at uh, checkerboards versus a blank screen. I think that was the contrast. And they showed this incredibly blurry picture with some red stuff in the back of the head. And that blew my mind. Like I looked at that and I thought, oh my God, 
right? What can we do with that? And it was like immediately, number one, we can resolve the mental imagery debate. Like everybody at the time was like, oh, mental images, what are they? Are they like images? Are they like words? Are they like something else? What are they? It's like, well, for God's sake, get in the scanner and mentally image. Um, and so I wrote uh, a research proposal for a bunch of experiments, a bunch of ideas on attention and imagery and various other things. And I sent it to all the pet labs in the world. There were only five. And none of them wrote back except for John Masiata, who very kindly, I, oh, and I wrote him a letter. I said, oh, I'm gonna be at the neuroscience meeting in LA anyway, this is total bullshit. Like grad students didn't go to meetings back then. There were no funds for this, but I was just faking it. So I'll be out there anyway, could I visit your lab? He's like, sure. So then, <laughs> so then I show up in his lab and I think he's expecting, you know, like an adult. <laughs> it's like, you know, Kind of disreputable hippie comes in <laughs> and uh i think I, I think i sort of lost the opportunity right there when he took one look at me um anyway after that i you know we met briefly and uh you know it didn't go anywhere um but i kept hounding him and everyone else like literally for a decade so i went on and did other things but i kept saying you know because me and lots of other psychologists like we had questions to ask about the brain like we studied the mind and so that's where the questions about the brain come from and instead most of the brain imaging equipment was controlled by you know radiologists who would do just painfully stupid things and we would just like tear our hair out watching these papers getting published in science and nature that were just so dumb and meanwhile, we were like, we had really good questions, but we didn't have access to the equipment and it was damned expensive. And this went on for years, you know, with a few exceptions. There were, there was a group at Wash U who was doing some pretty good stuff and like a few other exceptions, but mostly some pretty awful stuff. Um, so I went on doing behavioral experiments and, uh, you know, nudging people on the side. And I kept kind of, you know, banging on the door of neuroimaging, trying to get access and not getting anywhere. Um, Just and then, for, uh, uh, clarification, this was still during your PhD or throughout my PhD and literally for the next decade. Yeah, yeah. So I do my PhD and then at the, and then what happened was, um, the only way I got my PhD was that, um, Molly Potter was collaborating with Lean Intro and they were interested in what you could understand from very brief presentations of words. And so they wanted to know, they, Molly had this wonderful idea, which I think is a, a deep insight about cognition, that, uh, that you have extremely rapid online understanding of stuff in reading and in looking around in the world. And you know, stuff is just conceptual information is getting activated really fast, but, but most of it just kind of dissipates unless some of it goes together to make some kind of more meaningful chunk. And so she wanted to test this idea by presenting words in a rapid sequence um, where her idea was each word is briefly understood and quickly forgotten within like half a second. She was like, how are we gonna test whether there are these fleeting memories? She wrote this beautiful, like fascinating uh, chapter called Fleeting Representations with exactly that idea. And so she and Helene came up with this test where they said, okay, we're gonna have two different words in a string of words. Uh, uh, we're gonna have a word repetition with several other, other words in between. And the task is gonna be press a button when you see a word that occurred earlier in the sequence. And that will be at least some kind of indication that you're remembering words through this whole sequence, even though they're being presented really fast, like 12 words a second. Okay. And so I remember we all crowded around this like really rudimentary computer. <laughs> That's all we had at the time to look at these strings. And like there was something wrong with the code. There were no repeated words. And we checked and checked and checked. And actually there were repeated words. You just can't see them, even when there's several other words in between. And this was astonishing. And um, I meekly said, PhD thesis, can I study this thing? And amazingly, Molly and Helene, who by all rights should have said like, no, this is our idea. This is our discovery. You're a pipsqueak with nothing to show for your efforts. You go away, this is ours. They just kind of gave it to me. Um, and it was a blast because there were huge, massive effects. And I would do an experiment every few days where you know you had to run each subject one at a time. Um, you know, at that point, not on a tachistoscope, but on a computer, but you know, pretty rudimentary one. And so I did a PhD in less than a year with like 
I don't know, a dozen or more experiments in it because they were easy and fun and exciting and there were huge effect sizes. Um, so that's how I eventually got a PhD is to work on something no one else had. So I didn't have to replicate these teeny effects in the literature anymore. <laughs> um, so, but still I hadn't, at that point I hadn't planned to be a scientist because I was just trying to hold on by my fingernails and get the PhD and do something else because I felt like I didn't have what it takes. And so at that point I didn't have a plan for how to go on in science. So uh, Nancy, in spite of these successes, you still felt that you didn't have what it Well, took. it all happened so fast. I didn't really get a chance to make a new plan and I, right. and I or internally think, okay, maybe I'm not such a total loser. I have this one cool thing that I did. So in the interim, and also I was still very worried about, I was very politically involved and worried about all kinds of things, most especially nuclear weapons. Yeah. So I applied for this weird fellowship that was run by the MacArthur Foundation uh, that was designed to get people from all different fields involved in international security. And so I thought, well, cognitive psychology, international security, those were my two big interests. And at first they're like, I, I pictured this Venn diagram like this, like, okay. <laughs> And, but it was like a really good fellowship. It was two years, very few strings. You could go anywhere. It was like, I don't know, it was some large amount of money to me at the time. And, uh, and so every time I passed this notice on the hall, I would like try to push those things together. And eventually I got the Venn diagram to overlap briefly enough to write an application whereupon it immediately popped back, <laughs> <laughs> but I got the funding and, uh, and thought, what the hell, I'll try this. And so I spent, it was designed, since they were bringing people from different fields, it was designed so you spend your first year learning about international security, your new field, and then your second year applying your previous field to international security. So I went to the Institute for War and Peace Studies at Columbia and studied with an amazing guy named Robert Jervis, who was one of the few and main people at the time who had thought about how uh, psychology was relevant to foreign and military policy decision making. And he was fantastic. And I took courses on nuclear strategy and all kinds of crazy stuff. Um, and I had one publication from that time in the Journal of Conflict Resolution, in which I diagnosed what I thought was kind of a silly paper, but I took what I thought were the kind of stupidest things people said about um, about foreign and military policy, like deeply held stupid ideas. And I diagnosed each stupidity in terms of a different cognitive bias or reasoning <laughs> heuristic. <laughs> That's fantastic. Yeah, it was fun. But, you know, and, but then I just sort of felt like, okay, it's diverting, but really the reasons that we do all these stupid, stupid things in foreign and military policy is fundamentally economic, you know, they're big defense companies making money off of it and such. And the psychological factors are, um, you know, they, they make it, they, they enable it to happen, but they're not directly causal. So, um, so I felt like, okay, that was fun. And like, what about that repetition blindness stuff? That actually was kind of fun. Maybe I should go back and do that. <laughs> so you see, it really is a crazy story. Um, so then I wrote and um, I wrote a grant proposal to do research on repetition blindness. NIH had a thing at the time called the first award. I don't know if they still do. It was designed to get junior people who hadn't had a grant before funded. And I e didn't even have a, um, I didn't even have a position where I was going to do it. I just applied for this kind of through MIT, assuming I could take it someplace. And then the amazing Antriesman decided that I could bring it to Berkeley, which was no small thing. There's a, there was a heap of red tape making that tricky. And she had to go through a lot of rigmarole to enable me to bring my grant there so I could do the research there. She found me a teeny little room that was my office and lab. And I hung out in her lab with her and Danny Kahneman and the other brilliant people in their lab. And I did experiments on repetition blindness and it was pretty fun. So let me try to get, get in your mind at the time, right? So you had done this uh, fellowship on international security. You got a, a, a paper out of it, which uh, somebody just put in the link for, to in the, in the chat. So Nidhi, thank you. Um, the but best that, thing about that paper, by the way, is that there's a citation to um, Monty Python in one of the footnotes. Anyway, oh, just a sidebar. Uh, Go ahead. So cool. <laughs> um, 
but yeah, so what, what were, you, were you still torn? Like, do, do I want to do this and do I want to do that? It was by chance I'm going to- I did not have a long term. I did not have a long term okay. plan. Okay. I really did not have a long term plan. I just like, okay, this seems okay. Let's do this right now. Okay. Did you, did you um, consider anything that was more related to international relations or? Uh, I just did a little bit of activism on the side. I figured, okay, that was a fun lark. I can't make these things go together. Or I, I mean, I did, I did a bunch of sort of, uh, social psychology type experiments in which I was using actor observer attribution effects, uh, and asking to what extent they apply to how people think about, um, countries and their actions. And I do think those apply, but I found I could get any result I wanted by just how I constructed the stimuli. Mm -hmm. So it just felt like a cheat. And I just thought, okay, there's something here, but this is not to my taste. This mm -hmm. it just didn't feel, it felt disingenuous. Mm -hmm. um, and meanwhile, you know, that repetition blindness thing was pretty fun. There was more to do. <laughs> so, um, so I just went back to like, you know, studying perception and then just doing activism on the side where I could fit it in. Yeah. Um, and uh, yeah, so. Yeah, was that actually like, I, I, I recognize that very much, right? This balance between doing, being an activist and being a scientist. And very often I hear that uh, PIs are not very supportive of that typically, right? They, they want you to focus on your research and anything else you pretty much better not tell them, right? Is that, um, did you have a better experience than that? Or what do you tell your own mentees these days? Yeah, well, I think it's tough. And the, the, the primary reason it's tough is not that, I mean, I'm sure some of this too, but it's not so much that, you know, some PIs are jerks or that, you know, some students are not paying attention. The fundamental problem is there's only so many hours in the day, right? And so, yeah, you know, you can, you can and you should follow your passions, but there's only so many hours a day to follow those passions. And so you have to be smart about what you do and you have to make choices. And if you wanna do science, I think, I'm gonna get in trouble with this, but I think if you wanna do really important science at the cutting edge, most people can't do that and do lots of other things at the same time. Like, yes, you can have a family or you can be an activist or you can do a small number of other things, but you can't do everything and be a major scientist at the cutting edge, unless you're like really screamingly brilliant and even luckier than I've been, right? It's just hard. And so that means you have choices and there's a lot of places to land in that spectrum, right? I see all this stuff on Twitter about how it's like abusive to think that people might work more than 45 hours a week. It's like abusive. It's a freaking privilege, right? I think it's a privilege. Um, so I think, you know, I have, you know, I guess it's sort of retrograde views about work-life balance. Like, yes, you have to do things that are important to you, whatever they are. I never wanted to have kids, so I didn't make sacrifices there. It just never seemed like a good idea, so I was fine with that. But other things are important to me. It's, it was important to me to, you know, do occasional activism. It was important to me to spend time with my family, my parents, uh, and friends. It was important to me to go on adventures, hiking and sea kayaking. And I did all of those things. People should do the things that are important to them. Um, but there are choices in life. And um, I think if you want to be a really impactful scientist for most people, that involves a lot of hours per week. I think that's just what it is. And I think that, you know, it's very fashionable now to say that that's abusive and we shouldn't do that. And we've all moved on. And I just feel like, what planet are people on? <laughs> so I don't know. Yeah, I, I, I'm hoping people will fire back. I know this is sort of an unpopular opinion. I, I just think it's reality. But, and yeah. again, you know, not to say that you can't do other things. Yes, you can, but you have to be smart about it and you can't do every other thing. Pick the one or two other things that are really important to you and do those things as well. Um, but yeah, yeah. anyway. I don't know where we are. Should I keep going or should I yeah, just do yeah, questions? Go ahead, yeah. Um, okay, so so then somehow, amazingly, so I had a lot of fun at Berkeley. And then my partner moved to LA. He's a documentary producer. And we were apart for a while. And then it's like, okay, this is a brag. Uh, and there was a job at UCLA. So I was like, okay, what the hell? I'll apply for this job at UCLA. And back then it was just like, it wasn't like a whole formal thing where like there are people who can tell you how to do it and what does a 
application look like and what is it how was a job talk structured and you know on the one hand I was in this great lab but there just wasn't a tradition that of course you know, practice your job talk all this stuff like I know I didn't practice my job talk I didn't discuss it with anybody I was just off on my own having no idea how to do it and in fact about five days before for the week or two before my job interview at UCLA I started to really panic like I just, I just had no idea what I was doing and it was like nobody to tell me somehow. I'm sure if I had asked Andrew Friesman, she would have told me, but I was kind of intimidated by her and I didn't ask and she didn't vibe that I needed help or I don't know what. Um, so I got really panicky and then I stopped sleeping and then I couldn't think. And then that was a really bad rut. And then about a week before the talk, I just thought, okay, this is, this is really serious. So I called up my doctor and I said, listen, I need drugs. I need to sleep at night and I need to think during the day. I need to get out of the cycle. I was like, okay, great. So he gave me a prescription for Prozac. And he's, <laughs> and so the first night I did a Prozac, got some sleep. And the next day I woke up, I was like, okay, I can think again. Thank God. And so I quickly put together this job talk, which was probably terrible. I don't know. But anyway, somehow, amazingly, I got a job at UCLA and uh, spent four years there. And it was pretty fun there. I had a good time there. Um, yeah, and I don't know to what extent you're, uh, being self-deprecating here, but uh, do you feel that luck played an important role in you getting that job, or uh, like? Yeah, well, you, luck, luck has played an enormous. Uh, look, sidebar. I think luck plays a massive role in everything in life, not just science, everything, and we don't see it as much as we should. We credit ourselves for successes, and we blame ourselves for failures when yeah. often it's just like random stuff that happened. You know, so I think that's just a generally true thing. Yeah. And that's true here too. I mean, I think, you know, I, I mean, I, repetition of blindness was kind of a cool thing. I discovered some cool stuff. I mean, you know, I discovered that when you, when you repeat, so you have a sequence of letters or words, you present them quickly. People don't see the second occurrence of a repeated thing, even if it's a sentence or a bunch of letters spelling out a word, like they, they convert the word manager to manger. They lose the second A and they think they read manger. So you can make the second a red and nothing else was red. And the task is, what was the word you saw and what letter was red? And people would get illusory conjunctions and they would say, I saw manger um, and it was the G that was red, even though it was the A. Anyway, so there were, cool, there were a few things. I had some cool stuff in my job talk, but again, you know, I bumped into repetition blindness, Molly and Helene gave it to me, thank you. So that was luck. Anyway, so all this time I'd still in the background been you know, trying to claw my way onto um, brain imaging equipment with no luck. So I get to UCLA and I get a phone call one day from John Maziotta. And he says, oh, we're putting together a grant and we need a cognitive psychologist. And I said, well, you probably don't remember this, but we've met. <laughs> uh, he pretended to remember him, but he did. Um, anyway, so this went on and I said, I, you know, I, I still have good ideas for experiments and amazingly, they still haven't been done. And he's like, yeah, yeah, yeah. Just send me your letter of collaboration. So we went through this a few times. And then one day he says, the grant is going out this afternoon. I need a letter of collaboration in the next hour. Can you fax it to me right now? And I said, John, give me two subjects. And he said, okay. And that was the first brain imaging experiment I got to do literally 10 years after I first started writing proposals. Oh. Yeah. Um, and so, um, you know, it was PET. Um, and I wanted to see where you process shapes in the brain. And so I designed this simple three condition experiment. And since I had these two subjects, it had to be perfect. Um, and because, you know, if, this, if nothing happened with the two subjects, that would be it and the jig would be up. But I also wanted it to be things that I actually cared about, right? So I designed this thing to, to look at shape processing in the ventral pathway. And uh, I had line drawings of familiar objects and I wanted line drawings of things that were perfectly interpretable as 3D shapes, but that were not familiar objects. But that were like the familiar objects as much as possible, given that constraint. And so a PET scan was 70 seconds and I wanted to drive those neurons hard. So I figured I'd present two per second. And so I needed 140 images of each type. And I drew the first hundred 
novel objects myself and I just got stuck and I needed 40, 40 more objects. My mom is an artist and I was talking to her on the phone shortly before Christmas. And I said, mom, I'm just stuck. I'm trying to design this experiment. I need 40 more line drawings of stimuli. She says, fax me some of the ones you've drawn. Christmas Eve, 40 more stimuli roll out of my fax machine from my mom. <laughs> That's cool. Yeah. So that was my first um, brain imaging study. And um, didn't really work very well. And Rafi Malik had a functional MRI machine where he could do it faster and better. And so he published that result first. And he did a very similar study, really nice paper. That was the original paper on LO. Mine came out later. So, um, so then um, after about four years at UCLA, um, they were threatening to tenure me. And I had had fun there, but Molly said, you know, it's harder to move after you have tenure. And I was suddenly filled with panic. Life in LA, oh no. I mean, I had fun there, but I did not want to spend my life there. And meanwhile, functional MRI was getting going at uh, Charlestown in Boston. And I missed my friends and family and Northeastern culture. Uh, and so I applied for and got a job at Harvard. Um, so I'll just stop in a second. So then I land at Harvard, but I still have access to the functional MRI machine. So I, then I start my uh, lobbying process, trying to get access to the MRI machine, which is really tricky. And um, after, it took like a year or two. And then out of the blue one day, I get an email from Bruce Rosen. He said, okay, Saturday morning, six to nine, the scanner's yours. And I didn't know anything. I had no idea how to operate it. I didn't know. I didn't have a key to get in. I didn't have anything. Um, and oh, and also I had a long distance relationship. And I told my partner Saturday mornings and he said, okay, it's the scanner or me. <laughs> and I chose the scanner <laughs> and he caved. I sort of thought he would cave, but I wasn't sure. Anyway. I stayed. Um, <laughs> <laughs> high stakes yeah anyway and then i'll shut up in a second but then i was like okay i gotta learn how to run this thing i gotta learn how to analyze the data i have no idea how to do any of this i need some smart people to work with and so josh mcdermott was an undergrad at the time and it was freaking obvious even when he was 18 that he was brilliant it's like you come work on me work on this with me and marvin chun was a postdoc with uh patrick kavanaugh like marvin and so the three of us would drive over like in the middle of the night or early in the morning and run these experiments and like that scanner would crash and all hell would break loose. And uh, it was really pretty, it was pretty wild west, but it was a heap of fun. Oh, thank you. Yeah, so um, please enter your questions. You can also uh, raise your hand. Um, uh, one thing that I was struck by is that you mentioned several times that you had a lack of confidence, but so, some of the things that you were doing were pretty ballsy, like calling the journalist, going off to Nicaragua on a whim. So how did those two things coexist in, 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 within you? I think kind of academic confidence is a different thing. Yeah. But also, I would say, actually, I think it's an important point. People tend to think of academic confidence as like a fixed personality trait. I mean, I was a terrified, unconfident, shrinking violet in graduate school until I did experiments that worked. And all of a sudden this ego kind of came out of nowhere. And it's like, hey, I've got findings. Don't mess with me. <laughs> and you know, I didn't see that coming. Um, so I think that you know, there's nothing like success to build confidence when it isn't there before. Yeah. Yeah, interesting. Yeah. Even little success. You know, all I needed is one damn experiment to work, you know? Yeah. yeah. Um, and yeah, is, have you kept up your interest, in, uh, your ac activism or your uh, politics? Oh, sporadically. I've actually lapsed, not for any good reason. I just can't figure out what to do. People have ideas, send them to me. But I did do a lot of stuff um, in my earlier days at MIT. I got really enraged about um, US support of you know, the Israeli occupation. And I figured that was a good topic for me because especially when I started this almost 20 years ago, um, there was not, you know, far left circles were making noise about it, but it was kind of the live wire of uh, politics because you get called an anti-Semite if you dare say a single thing that's critical of Israel. And I thought, oh, perfect. You know, I'm an academic. What else is an academic career for? 
that would to enable you to meld off about unpopular things. So Ken Nakayama and Molly Potter and I launched Harvard MIT Divest from Israel. And that was a shitstorm. Oh my God, it was a shitstorm. So I was on Fox News getting interviewed by Neil Cavuto and uh, various other people, but it was a great platform to um, explain to people what was so destructive about US support of the Israeli occupation. It still is. <laughs> And then, you know, 10 years later, I got invited to serve on the external advisory board of a neuroscience institute in Israel. And I thought, oh, great. This way, I'll have the official fancy invitation. And that's how you get into the territories. Like, otherwise, it's really hard to get into the territories. Like, you arrive at Ben Gurion Airport. And they say, what are you doing here? You say, I'm going to go to a protest in the territories. Like, no, you don't, you don't get in. So I was like, oh, I'm on the visiting committee of the you know, blah, blah, blah. Uh, and then I would go to the serve on the visiting committee. And I would try to get some of the visiting committee members to visit you know, places with me in Palestine and give talks and some of them did. Uh, but then I would also go to demonstrations, which is pretty damn scary. I mean, like yeah. the Israelis will shoot you, they really will. I mean, I'm, I, it's scary, but I did a bunch of that. <laughs> so, and, then, and then I was also, um, before the Iraq war, we did a, um, a big effort to uh, basically laid out all the reasons, you know, people say now, how could you know? Oh, every, everybody who thought about it knew what a stupid idea that was. And so we had a web petition that got 10,000 American university professors to sign on, you know, against the Iraq war before it started. And I, I got, you know, I raised 30,000 bucks overnight. I took out an ad in the New York Times laying out all the reasons why the Iraq war was a bad idea. And we were right on every damn one, yeah. um, but you know, well, good or good. <laughs> yeah. is, is it um, disheartening to see that sometimes, um, like, impact is far away, if you, despite your uh, efforts in activism? Yeah, yeah. I mean, part of the reason I've gotten lapsed recently is like, what is effective? I don't know. I mean, I don't mind. I don't mind exerting a lot of effort for a little effect, yeah. but a lot of effort for like probably no effect. Uh, yeah. I, I don't know. I don't know. Yeah. I'm going to take some questions uh, from the chat. Uh, Heather is asking, uh, you said a couple of times that things were different when you were growing up in science than they are now. Um, what advice would you have for new PhDs now? Or, and I'm going to loop that in with another question. What advice would you give pa past Nancy? Yeah. I don't know. I mean, I do think they're different now. And in that sense, I'm not sure how generalizable my experiences were. I mean, I think it was a whole lot easier back then, right? There just were not as many people in the field. There wasn't as much competition. Um, like random people with weird ideas could, if they really pushed at it, get to run imaging experiments eventually. Okay, maybe after a decade. Um, but um, there was just more room, you know, especially, especially early on, like, 25 years ago, just like wide open. Like, you know, like none of the things I'm known for are like incredibly clever, esoteric ideas. They're freaking obvious. It's like, okay, there was heaps of evidence that phase processing was different in the brain. Well, let's just find it, duh. Let's scan people looking at faces and objects and find what bits respond more. This is not a big idea. It's pretty damn obvious. So I think that kind of stuff was a whole lot easier way back. There are not very many experiments with that kind of, you know, face validity, easy to understand, easy to run kind of thing. And so I just think it's harder now. So I don't know what the advice is. Um, yeah. Yeah. So you mentioned that uh, success builds confidence, but uh, yeah, success sometimes takes a while. So uh, Sylvia is asking, what, what can you do in the meantime if you're riddled with self-doubt? I don't know. Talk to talk to other people in the same boat. Actually, one of the things Molly did for me that was really smart was when my umpteenth experiment had failed. She said, you know, you're always doing these things by yourself. Like you come up with an idea and you run an experiment. And then when it doesn't work, you blame yourself. If you were working with someone else, the two of you would blame the literature or the field. And so I started doing experiments with my partner, John. And um, it's true. We, you know, we started doing like... Treisman's visual search papers have just started coming out. And we're like, that can't be right. Can't be, you know, you must be able to search only for the same color items, right? 
And it's like, we did experiments with, you know, T-scope. Like I made all the cards by hand with a magic marker on a piece of, you know, each stimulus hand drawn. Anyway, so we did those and like, yeah, you can search by the same color as guided search models later showed. Uh, but at first it's like, you know, we're not replicating the stuff in the literature. And so me and John were like, Anne Treisman's wrong, you know, <laughs> instead of what's the matter with me. Yeah. You know? yeah and I, I think that's, that's something we hear a lot in growing up in science. That's a, that you, your first tendency is often to blame yourself. And mm -hmm. there's so many also other possible causes that are probably more likely. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, cool. cool. Um, we're nearing the end. So maybe I'll, if there's any, any, one, any more questions, I'll take uh, one more. Okay. Um, Gael, do you want to actually speak yourself? Maybe that's easiest. Please do. I can only see the issue of, but I can guess that I want to hear your view. Okay, so uh, you would prefer me to, all right, uh, let me see if I can uh, unmute you. Uh, yes, uh, it should be possible now. Okay, sorry, I couldn't un unmute. Yeah, right. Nancy, uh, thanks for the really interesting story. Um, I wanted to push back a little bit on the issue of work-life balance. Um, so you said it's not abuse to demand many work hours. It's a privilege that we can do it. And it, it is a huge privilege to be working in a job where we want to do it, but I think the problem is that not everybody has this kind of privilege to work, you know, 80 hours a week at their current salary as a graduate student or a postdoc. They might have other things that they like, even if they don't love doing them, they have to do them, like have another job, for instance, to make more money or like taking care of family, et cetera. Um, and you said, you know, what world are they living in? And I kind of think, you know, we shape that world, right? We don't shape the world of, you know, the occupation in Israel. I wish we could. But we do shape the academic world um, in our departments. And so our expectations, our thresholds for what is needed to progress to the next step, et cetera, we set that bar. And we can say the people who work 80 hours a week, that's the, those are the outliers. We're not, you know, we're gonna have like diminishing returns. We're, we're gonna consider someone with 10 papers in their PhD the same as someone with five papers in their PhD um, because lots of people don't have that privilege. Um, so yeah, I just wanted to get. I, I totally that. hear you, and I'm so glad you said that because I, I know that my, you know, I know that people disagree with this. So I'm I'm glad to, that you said that. Um, the thing I get stuck with is I think in every field, whether it's you know my partner makes documentaries, and when I tell him what people says, he just laughs. He says, "You think that I could be making documentaries if I weren't working, you know, 60, 80 hours a week? Of course I couldn't. Every damn field is like that." So yes, no, we not every back. damn field actually. Wait, 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 wait. So <laughs> yes, we can and should push back. What I don't understand is how is it ever going to be the case in any field or enterprise um, where it's where it doesn't happen that those who have the privilege and I agree it's a privilege um, to spend more time at it aren't going to be able to have more impact. And if you have more impact, you're more visible. And yes, we can say, just give us your top five papers, not your top 10. I think that's a great idea. And that's a good idea for many reasons, this and others. Um, but I, I, I think, you know, I, I agree with the vision you aspire toward, but I see deep structural problems in enabling it to happen. Maybe that's my lack of imagination, but I just think there's always going to be people who have that extra time and can do that extra push but extra push for what, right? Many things have an impact. So if we only consider the extra time at the bench and impact versus the training your students and getting, you know, well, and totally lots of students are successful as impact. I just think we can be more creative in rewarding impact in its many ways. And then it won't be only the outliers can get a job. It'll be more balanced. And yes, some people will, will be outliers in all kinds of directions and impact on science. Like I'm not saying that we can guarantee that you work 45 hours a week and you get the next Nobel prize or not even prize, you, you know, discover the next great thing. But most of us don't discover the next great thing. We just kind of chug away, right? So it's still, you know, we're actually yeah. I totally you know. agree. Can I just say one little thing? Sure. I, it's like, I completely agree with the importance of mentoring. And I think actually the biggest scientific impact anyone can have is to mentor well, because then you have a multiplier of all those people. It's much more important than the stuff you yourself can do in your own lab. So I totally agree on that point. Cool. Uh, unfortunately, we have a hard stop at, uh, at two. So thanks everybody for coming. And Nancy, thank you so much for uh, frankly sharing yeah. your story. This was fantastic. All right. Thank you. Bye.
Take care. Bye.